All right. Um, thanks for the introduction. So, um, um, I've uh, I just realised that the title of my slide is not correct. Um, <laughs> um, but basically, I've I've used this picture here. Um, this is a nice uh, estuary from um, far eastern Victoria, and um, the reason I've used it is because it sort of typifies a lot of the coastal systems around here, which are quite sandy and shallow, and that that has some implications, I think, for for some of the traditional views of, of night or the importance of, of nitrogen cycling. Uh, sorry, just um, also before I proceed, I'd just like to acknowledge Ryan Woodland, my co-author. He's actually now in um, in Maryland, so if some of this work um, piques your interest. Um, he is he is a, fe a fellow American, and um, he's he's over back over on your side of the world. And of course, also Adam Kessler, who's um, was one of my uh, grad students and is now um, doing a postdoc with me. So if we move to the um, next slide after the intro slide, I'm just going to quickly go over some of the things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about just introduce what um, nit uh, nitrification and denitrification are. They're two key transformations in the nitrogen cycle. Then I'm going to go on to talk about some recent insights into denitrification in coastal waters, and, and some of it's um, our work, and some of it's just from the literature. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to just present a bit of a case study on the effect of nitrogen loading on on estuarine systems in Victoria, uh, and um, I think this is obviously very important. It's in, in the context of um, LID, which is which is obviously what the topic of this this forum is. Okay, so um, just starting off on a conceptual model of the nitrogen cycle. So I'll just walk you through this diagram here. So um, we can conceive of a few important parts of, of of this this diagram. The first is the the blue part is the water column. And then we've got the brown, which is the sediment. And I've subdivided that into two zones, which is delineated by the dashed line going horizontally across the page. We've got the oxic zone and then the anoxic zone of the sediment. The oxic zone is typically a few millimetres thick. And we can think of nitrogen, org N here, which is organic nitrogen, being broken down to ammonia. So the, the origin of that organic nitrogen is basically phytoplankton in the water column, detritus being broken down. So the first step in the nitrogen cycle is actually the production of ammonium. And that occurs both in the oxic and the anoxic zone. If we then um, continue through the nitrogen cycle, so some of that ammonium that's produced in the sediment can be released to the water column. And the significance of that is that that is bioavailable nitrogen. So that is basically nitrogen that can be taken up by phytoplankton. And so just to come to one of the actually the key points of this talk is why are we even talking about nitrogen and, and the reason that nitrogen is important is because it's one of the limiting nutrients in um, in co coastal ecosystems. Um, basically it's the missing ingredient that you need to make algae grow so particularly in Port Phillip Bay is a good example you put in nitrogen and basically you pretty well instantaneously get algae growth within a few days so so most coastal ecosystems are very highly nitrogen limited and as we put more nitrogen into those systems, we turn them greener and greener. And that can be both phytoplankton, so um, algae in the water column, and that can also be macroalgae, for example, sea lettuce, which you see um, around the coastal areas that are, have high nitrogen inputs. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures of that later. Uh, we also have the next step in the nitrogen cycle, which is um, uh, the conversion of ammonium to nitrate, and that is called nitrification, and that of course only occurs in the oxic zone, right? So that needs oxygen to occur. So this is an essential link in the nitrogen cycle because nitrate is the precursor to denitrification. So some of that nitrate can be released to the water column, which is also bioavailable for phytoplankton, but particularly in, in deep, dark, muddy sediments, a large amount of that nitrate is diffuses into the anoxic zone of the sediment, and that, at that point, it is used as an alternative electron acceptor to oxygen by um, uh, bacteria. So many bacteria are what we call facultative denitrifiers. They can basically denitrify when nitrate is, is available, and that produces N2 gas. And the reason that we're interested in this process is that it represents a sink for bioavailable nitrogen. So N2 gas is no longer bioavailable. In chemical terms, it's basically two nitrogen atoms bonded together with a very strong triple bond, which means that it's not really accessible to any organisms except for organisms that can fix nitrogen, which we call diazotrophs. Uh, and, and so that process is very energetically intensive. So, so primarily um, uh, phytoplankton and algae get their nitrogen from the fixed forms, which are nitrate and ammonium. And this denitrification is a sink for nitrogen. So um, a big um, 
control over the rate of denitrification is the, the degree to this coupling of nitrification and denitrification, as we say. And so if we go on to another slide, I've sort of highlighted those those key steps in the in the in, in, in the nitrogen cycle in this in this yellow box. So we've got organic nitrogen being ox, um, being um, degraded to ammonium, which is then nitrified to nitrate. That's an essential step. That nitrate then diffuses into the anoxic zone where it's um, lost as N2 gas. We can also define denitrification efficiency, and, and this is also a useful way of conceiving of how efficient the sediments are at removing nitrogen from the sediment. So percent denitrification efficiency is just defined as the flux of nitrogen divided by the total flux of inorganic nitrogen out of the sediment. So that's the flux of nitrate plus the flux of ammonium plus the flux of N2. So if we now then move on from that slide, which was the percent denitrification efficiency um, slide, I've now returned to that conceptual diagram um, that I showed before. And what happens, one of the key things that happens in um, ecosystems, particularly coastal areas, as um, organic matter loading increases, so we get more productivity, more phytoplankton reaching the sediment surface, that oxic layer becomes thinner as more, um, as, as more oxygen is consumed. The upshot of that thinning of the oxic layer is that we have less nitrification and then the final upshot of that is that we have less denitrification as well. So at a sort of first glance, it's somewhat paradoxical. Denitrification is a, an anaerobic process. And if we add more organic matter to make the system more anoxic, we actually decrease it. And of course, the reason for that is that there's this essential oxic step in the middle that needs to occur. So if we now move on to the next slide, what I have is a plot of denitrification efficiency versus the um, the DIC or the CO2 flux from the sediment. And the reason it's plotted versus CO2 flux is that's basically a proxy for how much organic matter is entering the sediment. And the key point is that we move from a denitrification efficiency of around 70% down to very low denitrification efficiencies as more and more organic matter reaches the sediment, i.e. as the system becomes more eutrophic, more, more algal growth. So healthy coastal ecosystems we can conceive of typically having a denitrification of around 70 percent. I'd like to stress that this is based on um, studies in primarily um, muddy sediments and I think also it's fair to say that many of these studies have also been undertaken in sediments which aren't euphotic so, so there, there isn't light reaching the sediment surface. And so these, these two, whether or not something's a cohesive muddy sediment versus a sandy permeable sediment and also depending on the productivity of the sediment, has important implications for how much denitrification actually can take place. So what I'm going to do now is just, um, if we now move on to the next slide, I just want to talk about a couple of case studies. Um, the first is the role of microphytobenthos, benthic algae. Um, so this is microscopic algae which lives on muddy sediments. Often you look at a muddy sediment, particularly in shallow waters, and you may think, well, there's nothing, there's nothing actually growing there. But in actual fact, if you take that sediment, and stick it in some acetone or some ethanol, it goes, the, the acetone and ethanol go extremely green. So there's a huge amount of algae on those sediment surfaces. Uh, and that's referred to as microphytobenthos. Um, I'm also going to talk about denitrification in permeable sediments. And that's something that's been a focus of my research over the last 10 years, um, picking that up from uh, my postdoc, which I did at the Max Planck for Marine Microbiology in Germany. And Mark, Marcus Whittle um, is, is really the person that got permeable sediments on the map in terms of their importance in, in, um, in uh, nutrient cycle or, or biogeochemical cycles in general. And I'm going to pose the question, or I'm going to be a bit, it, it often doesn't go down very well with my colleagues, but because uh, denitrification is often, you know, it's quite a popular process and in a way I feel like I'm, I'm trying to talk it down a bit. I, I did, you know, I, I am, a, I, I, I like denitrification, I'm, I'm not trying to talk it down, but I think all my studies show that maybe it's a bit less important than we think it is. So, so being a bit provocative here. Okay, so one of the first studies this is going back to the early 2000s, and of course the Danes um, do some marvelous um, biogeochemistry, and, and often their their papers have some some great insights. And so there was a debate over the 90s, and even possibly to the present day, as to the effect of benthic microalgae on um, denitrification. The early thought was that benthic algae would actually increase denitrification and the reason for that was it was thought that well it's known obviously that algae when they photosynthesize they increase the thickness of the oxic zone in the sediment which should lead to an increase in nitrification but of course against that potential stimul stimulatory effect 
we need to temper um, the assimilative demand for the um, algae themselves um, for nitrogen. So basically, they're they're um, creating competition for the for the nitrifying and the denitrifying bacteria. And I think, in general, it's fair to say that the algal assimilation of nitrogen really trumps any stimulatory effect from oxygen. And so, what this graph here shows nicely. Um, so moving on now, I'm not sure if I, I, I might have missed the to, to signals progressing the slide. So um, I'm on the slide title, Algae Reduced Denitrification Through Competition for Nitrogen Now. Uh, and what this, this plot quite clearly shows is that denitrification, and this is, this is denoted here on the y-axis as dn, um, that's nitri denitrification which is driven by coupled nitrification, denitrification, okay, so it requires the nitrification step. So we see that in sediments um, colonised by algae, we have very low rates of DN, okay, so that's the, the leftmost um, bar. Um, what they did, did then also in this experiment was um, also added nitrogen to um, the treatment with benthic algae, and we can see that there was a stimulation of denitrification, and particularly in the light. And so this supports the hypothesis that you know uh, oxygen production from photosynthesis can stimulate nitrification and denitrification, but it needs to be replete with N for that to work. And then finally, the rightmost bar basically shows that sediments heterotrophic grown in the absence of um, algae, and I think this is the low end treatment, basically have the highest rates of denitrification. And so what we can clearly see there is that the competition for um, nitrogen between algae and bacteria, the algae win. So basically, key upshot there is that in euphotic sediments, we would expect to see relatively little denitrification compared to assimilation. Next slide. And what I've now thrown in here is some measurements of denitrification um, from local systems. So this is in Western Port, um, which is a very large intertidal bay um, to the southeast of um, Melbourne. And what I have here is um, two plots, just two study sites, which I think are fair to say show um, show the general picture of, of the system, where we have the rate of denitrification or nitrogen fixation um, on the y-axis, and then we've got um, different conditions, whether it's dark. V is vegetated. Um, dark non-vegetated. So vegetated is with um, seagrass, which is um, Zostera, primarily um, Zostera mulleri, and non-vegetated is basically where we've got microphytobenthos. Um, DN and DW are the two rates of denitrification. DN represents denitrification from coupled not with nitrification. DW represents denitrification driven by nitrate from the water column. And the key thing is we can see that the rates are very low, okay, so they're almost non-existent, which again matches with the, the previous slide. So basically, denitrification doesn't really take place in, in, in sediments where there's a lot of light. And on the flip side of this, we actually see that the sediments are a net source of nitrogen, so there's a lot of nitrogen fixation. So I haven't introduced this process. Nitrogen fixation is the opposite of denitrification. It's effectively where N2 is taken from the atmosphere and, and um, converted into a bioavailable form like ammonium. And what was quite interesting about this is we see high rates of N fixation both on vegetated and vegetated, unvegetated sediments. Vegetated sediments colonised by seagrass are known to have high rates of N fixation. That's well known. Less recognised in unvegetated sediments. We think the key driver there is actually cyanobacteria, which are very abundant on these sediments. So key thing is that very limited um, uh, euphotic sediments really hang on to their nitrogen tightly and even actually add more to the system. And I've also now, if we go to the next slide, just basically showed another slide, and this is some work from Emily now, unfortunately, Emily to present today, and um, she may have had this slide in the presentation. I understand she is going to um, put it in the presentation, so I hope I'm not stealing any of her thunder. But the key thing here is, well, this is just one, one slide I've stolen from her paper, which basically um, looked at the fate of um, nitrate in a range of biofilters. And we can see we've got the green area um, there, which basically shows assimilation. We've got denitrification represented in the blue, and then we've got um, the yellow representing um, remaining nitrate in the, in the biofilter. And the key take-home message for this, I don't want to spend too much time on it, is that in the presence of assimilative demand, so vegetation, denitrification seems to be the loser. So if you give, give a system 
with lots of plants, nitrogen, they, they, they take it over denitrification. All right, moving on to the next slide. So now that, that sort of finished up what I wanted to say about um, the, the role of plants, I'm now going to move on to, to permeable sediments. So, so permeable sediments, basically sand sediments, they're quite different to cohesive sediments, and the key difference is um, in the context of what I'm going to discuss is that water can flow through them. So intuitively, I think we know that if you basically dig a hole at the beach and you get a bucket of water and you tip it into the hole, the, the, the water disappears pretty quickly, right? And that's quite clearly because um, the sand is permeable, the water moves through it. If you dug a hole in the mud and did the same thing, the water wouldn't disappear. So this has some very interesting implications for um, how elements are cycled in sandy sediments. Um, I've animated this slide here and um, I've now got some arrows there. Um, I, I don't know if they've hopefully come up. So what I've got here is a side-on view of some sand. And, and, and this is in a, a flume that we've set up in the lab. So basically the current is flowing. Um, I think it's flowing from the left to the right. It doesn't really matter. And what that current does flowing over that rippled surface is it leads to high pressure and low pressure areas. And we get high pressure areas um, in the ripple crests and low pressure areas at the, um, sorry, in the ripple troughs. So the low pressure area, uh, the high pressure areas and the low pressure areas are over the ripple crests. So what that leads to is this water flowing through the sediment as I've indicated by those arrows. And we can graphically see this effect if we look at um, just the colour of the sediment. The black there is um, ind indicative of reducing conditions, so conditions in the absence of oxygen, and the more yellow golden colour um, represents oxic conditions. So we can cl quite clearly see from this slide that oxygen is being pumped into the, into the sediment. So one of the questions that I've been working on, particularly Adam's really progressed this over the last um, four years, is well, how does nitrogen cycle in these permeable sediments compared to um, how they cycle in the cohesive sediments? I apologise, I've now moved on to the next slide. So now I'm on the um, schematic diagram of cohesive and um, permeable sediment. If we look on the left side of it, we've got the cohesive sediment, which basically represents the nitrogen cycle that I've already introduced. Um, we have ammonium being produced in the deeper layers of sediment, diffused into the oxic layer. Where nitrification occurs, the nitrate then diffuses back down into the anoxic zone where it's denitrified. In contrast, if we now look to the right side of the diagram, we can see that um, we have um, a situation which is um, changed by advection, as we call it, or movement of water through the sediment. We have a larger, thicker oxic zone, uh, and we have where, where nitrogen can be um, oxidised to nitrate. The nitrate can then be pumped down into the um, anoxic zone where it's then denitrified. Now, initially, when, when I started thinking about um, denitrification in permeable sediments, and this was way back in, in the day with Marcus in the early 2000s, um, we sort of thought that, yeah, permeable sediments are going to be a massive sink for nitrogen. And the reason is, of course, you know, you've got this big fat oxic layer, you're going to have a huge amount of nitrification, and then and then the advection is going to pump all that nitrate into the anoxic zone, and it's all going to be denitrified. So you know, just thinking conceptually, we thought, yeah, this is going to be really exciting. We're going to see a huge rate of denitrification in permeable sediments. Now, if we move on to the next slide, um, I've probably got this a bit out of order. I probably should have put this on the previously, but what this slide shows is basically an image of oxygen. A uh, side-on view of oxygen in these permeable sediments, and this can using um, a planar optode. So Ronnie Glood basically um, invented these, so we've been working quite a lot with with him. And basically, you can see 100% saturation of oxygen in the water column, and then these very distinct zones of um, oxygenation um, within the ripples, where the oxygen, where the water is pumped in, and then these anoxic black zones, where the water is moving out of the ripple. And so. What Adam did as part of his honours project um, and also moving into his PhD was he set up a model to describe the oxygen and nitrogen cycle in permeable sediments. Now, people have been doing this for decades in, in cohesive sediments because you only need a one-dimensional model and they're relatively easy to set up. Um, again, um, it was through my work with um, in my postdoc where I sort of where I saw this being done, these, these two-dimensional models being set up, and that was with Jack Middleberg. I need to acknowledge him here because he, he was one of the person who got the, balls roll, the ball rolling um, using Comsol to set up two-dimensional models to describe nitrogen cycling in um, permeable sediments. And so what um, we were able, or what Adam was able to do with this model is if we look at the top diagram, we can see oxygen distribution throughout the sediment. Um, and the model simulates very nicely um, that, that two-dimensional um, distribution around the ripple. 
And then if we look down um, below that, we can now see um, a model of um, denitrification in permeable sediments. So those hot spots you can see in the sediment indicate the regions where denitrification um, is taking place. Now, in, in muddy sediments, it's relatively easy to measure denitrification, and people have been doing that for the best part of two decades now, whereas in permeable sediments, it's actually really bloody hard to measure denitrification. We've been doing it in our flume, but part of the problem is when you've got a flume, you're always losing some of your labelled N2 gas to the atmosphere. So, so the, in practice, it's been really hard to measure denitrification in the flume, but what we can do is make measurements of the 15N2 concentrations in the pore water and we can use that to validate our models. And so this is what Adam did quite su successfully in his honours project and also continued to do in his um, PhD. And um, I'll just quickly show um, one of the um, ways in which he validated that. And so one of those again was using the flume. And again, this was involving Ronnie as well, who, who really likes um, novel sensor techniques. and. So we came up with this, this design. So now we've moved on to the next slide. So I've moved on from um, those images of uh, oxygen distribution and nitrogen distribution in the sediment. I'm now on the slide where we've got the, um, the grey grids. So on the left we can see we have this grey grid which is basically um, a sampler. And that, that grid had these little wells um, about five millimetres deep. And we filled those each of those grid cells with um, a... Um, an acrylamide gel. We then stuck that gel into the side of the flume, which is shown in schematic B, which basically um, gave us a cross-section of the, of, of the ripples. What we then did is added tracer to the flume, and then we sampled those gel cells for 15N2, which we were able to use to put together a two-dimensional map of nitrogen of 15N labelled nitrogen concentrations around the ripple. So now if we move on to the next slide, which has got those um, coloured figures, we've got um, on the left some measured distributions of 15N in the sediment and on the right we've got some modelled distributions of 15N in the sediment. Now the resolution isn't great but it's, it's, it's as good as we could get within the detection limit of the, um, of the method. So we could measure lots of um, on the top top diagram, um, we can measure this as total denitrification. So this is denitrification of the 15N tracer that we added. Um, on the bottom diagram, we can also calculate the rate of coupled nitrification, denitrification, so that's what we call DN. And we can see that the rates of that are very low. And the really significant part of this is that, again, if we put in the, the conditions that we had in the flume is the model, we can actually model both the spatial distribution and the concentrations um, uh, or, or the, the, the rates with a, what I would regard as a pretty good match to what's, um, to what's being observed. So this gives us quite a degree of confidence that the model actually um, um, is giving us a, a realistic representation of what's going on in the, in, the, um, in the sediment processes. And so to cut a long story short, we basically then, if we now move on to the next slide, what we found with this model is that the rates of coupled denitrification um, within permeable sediments are extremely low. And again, this kind of, as you know, going back to our original hypothesis, this is very counterintuitive to, um, to what we expected. Um, and I'll just talk you through this diagram now to sort of explain that. So if we now start at the top of the diagram, this is the, um, the scenario of cohesive sediment. So in a muddy sediment, we have, as I said, ammonium diffusing up um, from the anoxic zone into the oxic zone. The oxic zone of the sediment is only a few millimetres thick, so we have lots of nitrification occurring in that thin zone. We then have diffusion transporting that nitrate both up and down. Now if we think about it, diffusion is actually a very fast process on the scale of millimetres. So quite a lot of the nitrate that is produced in that oxic zone is very rapidly diffused into the anoxic zone where denitrification takes place. And under optimum conditions, as we saw in the previous um, earlier slide, was that, um, not the previous earlier slides, we get up to 70% denitrification occurring. If we now think about the scenario moving down to the second part of the diagram to um, uh, permeable sediments, the sort of scenario we have is as follows. We have these very stratified two-dimensional zones. So if we look, start down at the anoxic region of the sediment, we have ammonium being produced within the sediment. And the way that the water flows in permeable sediments is up through the ripple crests. 
So what that actually does is create a conduit for um, reduced nitrogen to be reduced to release directly into the water column. Nitrate, on the other hand, is typically cycled just through the oxic zone of the sediment. So there's actually very little crossover of the nitrate produced in the oxic zone into the anoxic zone. So this sort of gave us this conceptual diagram here where basically ammonia produced in the sediment is released to the water column. And the denitrification efficiencies we typically see in permeable sediments are down around 5 maximum, maybe 10, 5 to 10 percent. So the upshot of this was counter to what we thought denitrification in permeable sediments is extremely um, inefficient. Okay, so that's kind of finishes up just the, the little spiel I had on, um, on, on some of the process studies. I, I just want to now just finish up by just talking a little bit about some of our work where we've looked at the impacts of nitrogen loading on, on coastal systems. And the case study I'm going to use is the effect of nitrogen loading on Australian vegetation across the, um, the state of Victoria. And what we undertook was um, a study where we um, selected a range of catchments ranging from pristine. So we're quite fortunate in Victoria if we go to certain parts of the state, we still have catchments um, where, the, um, where the vegetation is effectively um, intact and, and there's been no development at all in the catchment, ranging through to extremely highly ag uh, um, um, urbanised and also agriculturally dominated catchments. So now I'm on the slide focal point, um, hopefully you've caught up to me. Um, and so what we're looking at is the influence on nitrogen loading on the plant primary producer community. Um, and so when I'm talking about primary producers, I'm talking about um, how, how the system shifts from um, seagrass um, to, to macroalgae. So now if we move on to the slide um, titled primary producers, um, the way we did this was using a combination of um, aerial imaging, so collaboration with um, engineering. One of the, um, well, the, actually the head of civil now um, has a has a plane, um, and so he took a whole lot of aerial images of estuaries across the state. And we also um, used boats to ground truth those um, aerial images to um, to classify whether the sediment was bare, vegetated by macroalgae, or vegetated by um, seagrass. If we now move on to the second part of the slide, which has been animated, primary producers, what that diagram shows is um, on the far left shows, um, a map of the um, one of the estuaries, the Curtis Estuary, which is basically just some classification based on um, spot drops of um, an underwater camera that were made in the estuary. And then in the middle, we can see some images of the different um, habitat types. So at the top, we can see macroalgae. So in this case, we have ulva. In the middle, we have an unvegetated sediment, so it's effectively microphytobenthos, and in the bottom, we have um, a seagrass-dominated sediment. So for the purpose of this study, the key thing that we're focusing on here is whether the, the, the ratio of seagrass to, um, to macroalgae. So if we now move on to the next slide, this is just an example of the sorts of vegetation maps that we produced. Um, on the top and also on the bottom of the um, slide is um, a map of the um, different or, or a map of Victoria showing the locations of the um, of the different estuaries. So what uh, and this was Ryan who undertook this work. He made these vegetation maps and so what he did then was basically calculated the total area of the estuary that was either covered in seagrass versus macroalgae. So and the way we then looked at this was as the ratio of um, macroalgae to to total vegetation. So just moving on through the animation, we have a macroalgae to TV ratio of zero, representing pristine or clean seagrass. So this is the non-neutrified state. Moving through to macroalgae to total vegetation ratios of 0.85 to 1, where we see the system is completely dominated by macroalgae, and we describe that as a quite eutrophied system. And so as I said, we then looked at this ratio of macroalgae to total vegetation as a function of um, nitrogen loading. And so we now move on to the next slide, where we have this plot of macroalgae to total veg as a function. Oh, um, um, I apologise. The, um, the, 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 the title of the, um, of the x-axis has dropped off. The x-axis is um, DIN loading, so that's dissolved inorganic nitrogen, which is effectively nitrate loading. Um, in um, tonnes per kilometres squared per year. So what we very clearly see is that as the um, nitrogen loading increases, 
we get this very rapid threshold at around 10, uh, sorry, five to 10 tonnes of, um, of nitrate per year, where we flip the system from being pretty well. I can drive well. you. Do you want to pick me up? Sure. What time? Pretty, I don't know. It starts at night. Uh, can someone mute, please? Um, so we then um, see this very rapid change from um, low eutrophication, so dominated by seagrass, up to dominated by um, macroalgae um, at around, as I said, five tonnes per um, kilometre squared of, of the estuary um, per year. So I suppose the analogy here, you know, listening to the other talks, is that we're seeing this very low and clear threshold. So, so the previous talks were talking about percent of the catchment that is impervious. But um, we talked, I think the threshold there was between 2 and 5% um, imperviousness. So we see very rapid um, flip at that point. And so here we're seeing quite a rapid flip from, from um, dominated by um, seagrass to dominated by algae around 10 tonnes of um, nitrate per year. And the other interesting thing about this study, if we now move on to the next slide, is that the relationship is actually, so the relationship that we observed, which is shown here by the solid line, is, is remarkably similar to the relationship observed in other studies in the US. Now these studies were undertaken not in the same way as us, we used a spatial gradient. Um, some of these, well, most of these were mostly undertaken by time series measures in the one estuary. So I think it's quite remarkable that we're seeing such a, such a similar threshold around five, maybe ten tonnes nitrogen per kilometre squared per year as the, um, as the threshold for for um for this 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 change in, in benthic vegetation. Okay, so moving on now. Um, what I've shown here is um, uh, a slightly different plot, and, and probably I just want you to focus on the on the top right graph here. And I've again shown the same eutrophication index that we saw before on the y-axis, but in instead of plotting it versus nitrogen load in this case, I've actually plotted it versus um, the percent of the catchment fertilised, okay? So we're actually not even looking at um, any measures of nitrogen going into the system. All we're using is land information database to basically say, well, what percent of that catchment is fertilised? And we see quite clearly that relationship is extremely strong. So we don't even need to actually measure nitrogen loads. Um, we can just look at um, the percent of the catchment fertilised to get an idea of the risk these estuaries have of being eutrophied. And I think this is very elegant because basically um, you know, from a planning perspective, and also I think from an engineering perspective, we can we can simplify the problem down and, and allow us to sort of plan ways or working out ways to solve this problem from a much broader sort of landscape scale. All right, so um, I've got some text in there, which is probably not all that relevant, so, so we'll just move on now. Okay, so um, if we now move on to the conclusion slide, um, I've sort of I think many, shows, many shallow coastal systems, there's very little um, nitrogen removal through um, denitrification. Um, nitrogen has a clear marked impact on coastal systems, um, as I showed, uh, and, that, and that pattern of impact is, I think, very similar to what you observe um, throughout the world. So one of the questions I'm sort of posing in the, in the context of this forum is, I wonder whether the key focus of LID nitrogen removal should actually be in the agricultural areas, because I think you know these are the key culprits for um for nitrogen inputs, and particularly in the Australian context, it's seen as a really big growth industry in Australia. Um, the the Asian market is seen as being sort of a big growth area for for, for, for um, our food, and one of the ways to increase our profits is to intensify our agriculture. And I guess the analogy there in the states is what's happened in the Mississippi Basin and the impacts of that on the um on the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, creating that, that sort of um, dead zone of, of anoxia. So, so effectively, the similar problem to what I just described, but on a much, much larger scale. Uh, and that's it from me. So thanks for listening. OK, thanks very much, Tim. So our Perrin. Um, so do we have any questions for Perrin? I, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a bevy. Um, great talk, um, really nice overview of a lot of the the research that you're doing and some of the the um, sort of uh, key findings that that you're um, excited about. I was really pleased to see that summarized so cleanly. Um,
I, I guess I had a couple of questions for you. Um, you know, um, one is this idea that um, that we're not getting much denitrification, if I understand correctly, um, because essentially the nitrate is really not able to to mix into the anoxic zones very well. That that in in advectively dominated systems, basically you end up with the zonation that you talked about in the US and T paper, which which to some extent limits um, rates of denitrification. Um, but then, you know, right now in the stream um, literature, there's, there's a lot of interest in microzones with the idea that, that heterogeneity within the sediment creates very localized regions of anoxia within bulk oxic regions, which actually end up dominating denitrification. And in fact, if you look at N2 evolution, you're seeing as much N2 evolution in oxic zones as in uh, anoxic zones. Um, so the you know the the t time to go to an anoxia isn't such a driver for denitrification in those circumstances. So I'm just wondering if the kind of different set of conclusions that you're coming to may speak to differences, fundamental differences in um, coastal permeable sediments versus stream permeable sediments, and specifically maybe less heterogeneity in the coastal sediments. Thanks very much, Stan. That's a, a great point. And actually, I did mean to, um, I did have a note to self to sort of touch on that conundrum there. Um, you know, we've obviously worked on some things where we've come to some different conclusions. So, yes, fundamentally, um, there's a few key differences between streams which I think change the conclusion um, in stream sediments to, to what you're likely to see in, in coastal sediments. And the key one is that the nitrate concentration in stream sediments is, is many orders of magnitude higher than it is in coastal sediments. And I think the key part of this, this, the, the, you know, the break in the nitrogen cycle is through the lack of nitrification. The zonation breaks nitrification. So coastal waters see very little nitrate. Streams have, as I said, massive amounts of nitrate. So, so the nitrification problem isn't, isn't there. So, so we have a lot of nitrate in the water being pumped into the sediment. And so then the question is how much of that actually makes it into into anoxic zones, and again, you know, as your, your very elegant analysis has shown, it's basically the, the, the you know the path length and the dam collar number basically that, that 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 determine you know whether it's going to be end up being going anoxic with nitrate present and being being denitrified. So I think in streams, in the context of streams, that does occur more. So so I think the degree of pumping of nitrate into the anoxic zone is is much higher. Um, and, and as you said too, I think, you know, this idea of heterogeneity, so, you know, you think of streams being full of um, sea POM, as they say, coarse particulate organic material. Um, terrestrial plants tend to be larger and lumpier than phytoplankton. So, you know, uh, the, the, the idea of micro niches in coastal sediments, they talk about it. I'm yet to see much evidence of it. I did some experiments actually on this um, where, I, where I dumped a pile of macroalgae into the flume. So we made these little oxic... Um, uh, sorry, we made these little anoxic micro, well, I wouldn't call them micro niches, I would call them sort of centimetre scale niches. And we were hoping to see lots of denitrification around those. And again, sort of what happened was in practice that the water was deflected around them and there wasn't, wasn't really a lot of entrainment of the, of the nitrate into the, into the um, anoxic zone. Hmm. So, so in the context of coastal systems, I, I haven't seen much evidence for that, but but, you know, I think the flow paths are probably a lot more complex in, in streams than they are in coastal, in coastal waters. So I guess the upshot is I haven't given up on streams as being good denitrifiers as I have coastal waters. <laughs> so so if, I, if I understand, then actually the limit is on the nitrification, um, as you see it, not so much getting the nitrate into the anoxic zone. Um, and, and then yes. I was going to also ask, um, you know, maybe it isn't as clear then uh, about N2O production and incomplete denitrification. And so whether, um, ironically, the, the, the permeable sediments might be, um, you know, great at, at producing a greenhouse gas. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, you know, um, I have done a few experiments looking for nitrous production and I haven't seen a lot, but um, I haven't. I've got to say I haven't done that exhaustively. I know I know that people are talking about that. I've I've heard I've heard some talk about that. Um, I think the you know the way I conceive of nitrous oxide production being or the, the conditions under which I conceive of nitrous oxide production being high are one sort of we've got suboxic 
so not not completely anoxic, uh, and secondly, high nitrate. And so streams, I think, potentially could have a lot of nitrous oxide production. Yeah, and again, if it, if it's sort of the mixing of the, um, so you have your anoxic chimney, and if it's a matter of kind of mixing the nitrate from an anoxic region into the anoxic chimney, that's kind of rate limiting. Then, then you know, maybe um, um, sort of partial denitrification would be uh, would be an issue. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I don't mean to dominate. I just had one last question, and and um, you know, we we have been looking at. Um, at um, these um, planetary boundary issues, and um, and you know, a great paper in Science um, by Stefan et al. looking at planetary boundaries and and yeah. basically fingering nitrate as being one together with phosphate, which is uh, phosphorus, which is already crossed. And mm -hmm. and I asked one of his, my students to dig into that a little bit, and and the answer was that it has to do with um, the possibility of a global ocean anoxia. Event which, geologically speaking, um, happens. Uh, I'm just wondering if you can kind of comment on kind of where we are um, in overall nitrate release to the ocean and, and how far away are we from a global ocean anoxic event if the planetary boundary has been crossed? I think my feeling is we're quite a long way away. I think, well, well you know, certainly. So, um, Depends on your context, right? I mean, Australia has relatively low, you know, we, we see local effects, but I think there'd be nothing getting off the shelf, right? Because our systems are so starved and starved, they just take everything up. So in the context of global, you know, global relevance, you know, the Mississippi, you need, you need that sort of scale system. And, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, you see it on a small scale. Mm -hmm. The Gulf of Mexico is probably, in my view, a worst case scenario because A, Apart from when you get hurricanes, I think it's fair to say that it's quite sheltered. It's quite, you know, it's quite a calm ocean, uh, and it's got, it's a relatively small, um, small sea given the volume of water coming down the Mississippi. So, to be honest, uh, I, I think we're we're quite a long way away from that. Is my feeling. I mean, you know, there there is um, evidence again for in the Arabian Sea. There is evidence, I think, for increasing anoxia, and that's partly driven by um, Warmer water, so obviously the warmer the water gets, the lower the oxygen saturation. Uh, sorry, the lower the ca capacity to hold oxygen gets. So you know you get lower oxygen concentrations. Uh, and there's also some talk about you know um, changes to the monsoon and also changes to the amount of nutrients coming down the system. So that's potentially another hot spot. Um, the North Sea is such a high energy sea. You know there are times when there's um, lower oxygen in that sea, but I, I think on a on a much larger scale than that. Um, I don't know. I, I think, you know, if you have systems like the Arabian Sea flipping to anoxic, because at the moment it's suboxic, and what's happening in there is you've got a lot of nitrate buildup. So if, if that system were to flip um, anoxic, and there's people doing some work on this at the moment, I think there might be some stories coming out soon. I, I better not say too much. Um, if that system were to flip anoxic, you might actually see less nitrogen in the ocean because you would have this huge body of currently oxic water with this full of nitrate suddenly being denitrified. Mm. But then that's sort of a negative feedback on that. So so I think, you know, from my perspective, I think, you know, it, it is a global issue. There are there are massive effects on coastlines and, and ecosystems, but I, I don't feel I I think this sort of idea of some global ocean anoxia is Apart from the sort of case studies I just mentioned, I don't, I don't, I don't see that happening. <laughs> it's my feeling. Great, thank you. Anybody else have questions? So I have one. Um, uh, so very interesting relationship amongst amongst your uh, uh, watersheds with different loadings, and I'm wondering if what will happen if you can reduce the nitrogen loading to the macroalgae vegetation ratio, will it go right back down the same curve or is there some sort of hysteresis or something that will make it harder to get back to the way it used to be? Yeah, I mean, so definitely the paradigm is that it follows very strong hysteresis. It's, you know, I think, you know, if you look at the work of Duarte and people who have who've, who've sort of thought about this, the, I think there's even a paper on it, you know, um, Return to Neverland or something, you know, can you, can you go back down the same curve? And I think, mm -hmm. I think the general idea is that you can't, 
once the system's been flipped over. I, I reckon these systems are actually quite well flushed, to be honest. I do think, you know, within a decade or so, you would get a response going back down that curve. I don't know how, how it would trace the path, but I think, you know, you could you could get that. And, and yeah, so, I mean, Melbourne, you know, Melbourne Water are very interested in, in, in that very question, you know, can we pick an estuary and sort of extend Stringybuck Creek to that kind of, to that sort of scale. All right. <laughs> Good. All right, thanks. That is hard. It's very hard. And then and then undertaking the works to, to reduce the nutrient loading. So you've got you've got to do the stringy buck project, right, which is a decade or two. And then after that's complete, then you can maybe start on the estuary. That's but such a <laughs> right down the line. Yeah. And we've had discussions about that just I mean you've mentioned the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico, so you know, attempts throughout the whole you know, Mississippi drains, I think, a third of the United States. So that's a, that's a big area to try to control nitrogen yeah. influence over. Yeah. So. Yeah. And um, as Tim said, I mean, Peter Crofton's done lots of work on that. Mm -hmm.